Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Jeff, aka Geekers, here. Welcome to the Black Sight Files from Unsolved Mysteries Season 1, Episode 10 Review. This is a review of all the cases that were seen in Season 1, Episode 10 of Unsolved Mysteries that was posted on YouTube. As always, if you like what you watch, which I hope that you are because you are watching this as a fan of Unsolved Mysteries, feel free to click that subscribe button, click the bell, click the like. And you will be alerted, I was about to say rewarded, but you will be alerted when uh, new content is revealed. In this episode, there, that I, there were four, well, three cases that I covered, and one of the cases was actually omitted that I, it was my choice. So, in the first case, we had uh, Ann Sigmund Gary Goff. Uh, which was a wanted case. I will, I'm going to uh, break down each of these cases further in the following segments. This is just a, like a quick overview. In the second case, which was omitted because this case was actually covered in an earlier episode of Black Sight Files of Mental Mysteries, there was the Don Henry and Kevin Ives case. I will get into why I also omitted this case from this episode of, or this uh, series of cases from Black Sight Files from Unsolved Mysteries. In the third case, which is like, this case has always remained one of the big uh, influential cases of Unsolved Mysteries. When you talk about UFOs or uh, unidentified flying objects or whatever you want to call it, Missing time always comes up, ladies and gentlemen. And we are going to, I will be talking about Robert Matthews, also known as the missing time case. Finally, we have a case that was actually kind of sad. We have the missing persons case of Rogers Kane. Uh, basically, Rogers uh, disappeared and he was never seen from again. This really goes to show that even the best of people can fall through the cracks and never be seen again. Now, let's get to the first case, the case of Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff. Okay, so Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff were accused of murdering Charlie Sigmund, or Charles Sigmund, as that's his full name, but Charles Sigmund. Uh, it's believed that possibly he was murdered because he found out that Ann Sigmund was possibly a practicing witch. Now, is that something that warrants somebody to be killed? No, I don't think it does, but this is also back in the 80s. A lot of stuff has changed, ladies and gentlemen. Back in the 80s, we had satanic panic. Now we actually have, you know, we, uh, the, oh, God, I think it's like the Church of Satan or the Satanist movie or whatever. It's, it's slowly making the news. Every, everything that was seen as evil back, you know, back in the 80s, is starting to be more, it's starting to be reevaluated, I guess you could say. But yeah, so uh, as of recording this, Gary Goff turned himself in basically. He was like, you know what? I'm done running. I, I, I'm done running. I don't want to do this shit anymore. And Sigmund, however, has never been located. The uh the theory is possibly that Gary Goff killed Ann Sigmund prior to him turning himself in. Now, there as always, there is two sides to to every coin, basically. On the Charles or the, the I'm just gonna refer to him as Charles Sigmund instead of Charlie. On the Charles Sigmund side, we they are claiming that Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff killed uh killed Charles Sigmund because of the fact of what he found out. However, if you listen to the Gary Goff camp, because basically he was the only one, he's the only one that has turned himself in. Gary Goff is basically claiming that Charles Sigmund uh, appeared, I think it was at his house, if I remember correctly, or his trailer or whatever. And he was drunk and he started attacking uh, Ann Sigmund. And basically, uh, you know, they, de they defended themselves against Charles. If that's true, ladies and gentlemen, if he if he was attacking them and they had to defend themselves, why run? If, if if this guy was clearly a threat and you protected yourself, there's no reason to run. At least in my eyes, it if the if the evidence at the scene shows that you were protecting yourself, why run? You know, but yeah. 
So that was the case of Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff. It, this is, like I said, this is a wanted case. And, uh, eat, and I will put the links to all of these cases that you see in this video in the description below. So that was the case of Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff. In the second case of this episode, which I actually omitted, we have the case of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Uh, basically, I omitted this case, this this case, basically from uh, this see uh, this episode of uh, Black Sight Files from Unsolved Mysteries for a couple reasons. Basically, number one, this I already covered this case uh, previously on Black Sight Files from Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, granted, this case pulls at my heart, but really, I I I, I feel like I'd just be retreading the same thing again. If I covered the case, yeah. Also, there was really nothing new offered in this, uh, in this, uh, oh God, I don't want to say, re basically a rewrite, yeah. Uh, I don't think that they offered anything really new. Everything that they said in this little segment was actually uh, covered in the uh, full length case. So I really didn't feel that it, uh, that warranted needing to be retold again. If they actually had new stuff, I would have I would have covered the case, but they didn't. So I figured I would just omit this case. You can always find it. I I will put the in the uh, oh god up here right right up there in the corner. I will put the link to this case for you all to see that I did earlier. But, uh, yeah, it's a tragic case, but like I said, there was nothing really new, so I just decided to omit it. And if I come across a case that, you know, I've covered before, most likely I will omit it unless something new has been added, basically. The big case for this episode, I feel, is the Robert Matthews uh, also known as the missing time case. Now you're wondering why does this case get the missing time uh, alternate title? You know, and that that's actually quite that that's actually a good question. I have the full Unsolved Mysteries DVD box set, and they just went by uh, case titles. They don't actually have the person's name. So basically, for this case, it was it was part of the UFO. Uh, little box set that was part of the set and they just called it missing time so i will try to do that you know if i can remember to do you know the robert math you know the name of the person and then the alternative title i actually did not do that with the don henry and kevin ives case on the dvd box set the don henry and kevin ives case is actually known as the friends forever case if i remember correctly but yeah, so this case is what really, what was the standout case for this, uh, for this episode. Granted, while I like the Don Henry and Kevin Ives case, the difference between that, pre that, uh, the, the omitted case and the original run of the Henry and, uh, Ives case is that basically if you watch the video which i'll put the link to like i said uh basically it was just robert stack talking to the police uh police detective it was it was more as like the it was more like an impersonal you know just a little conference it didn't really have the case itself so that's why i feel that this case the robert matthews case is like the standout case for this episode of Unsolved Mysteries. You cannot talk about UFOs or alien abductions without mentioning missing time. And Robert Matthews is tied to that case. Uh, his retelling of what happened to him under hypnosis is fucking scary, dude. It, it, it's something that you should really sit down and listen to time, you know, for a few times so you can, like, absorb everything that he is telling you because everything he says, oh, boy, you know, it's like we, we are not alone out there, ladies and gentlemen. We are not alone out there. And the one, th another thing about this case I love is the, it's the way that they recorded 
this case. A lot of, well, basically the first couple of seasons of Unsolved Mysteries had that rough, uh, low quality recording style that a lot of people love. It wasn't as refined and professional as it is, like say seasons four, season four and onward. It's actually, this is actually as raw as you can get. Another thing that they did with this case, they, I'm not sure if it's just me or if other people feel the same way, but to me, they did an awesome job building up the environment of this case. You you really got that, that sense of like dread and foreboding, forebo foreboding, foreboding, foreboding when it comes to this case. Uh, I actually, uh, when I covered this case, I, if I remember correctly, I went on to, uh, Google maps and I looked up the location and it has had a little bit of a, of a change over the years. And you can possibly see that in the video, but yeah, like I said, as you know, if you were to pick out a standout case in season one, episode 10 of Unsolved Mysteries, this would be it. Next up, we have what if, if if the Robert Matthews case kind of made you like kind of scared due to like the unknown aspect of everything. This case actually makes me real sad because this case goes to show that the that the most that the nicest of people they can literally be gone like that. That's what happened to Rogers Kane. Uh, basically, Rogers, if I remember correctly, he was uh, like a service department worker, uh, or what, or a public works de uh, worker for Los Angeles, if I remember correctly. Uh, basically, he was not feeling well one day, so he decided to not go to work. And then I'm not sure it was the day after or that same day he decided to go to a nearby tool store, if I remember correctly, and he disappeared. The poor guy's gone. And this really, kind of, like I said, this pulled at my heart because my mom, she died a, a few years ago. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the thought I can, I, I, I know how they feel because they lost their loved one. You know, like we, we don't know what happened to Rogers and that I, I, I feel bad for them because I went through the same the same experience. The only difference is I actually had some, even though it was painful as all hell, I had a little bit of closure, you know, Rogers Kane, his family, they, they don't know what happened to him. He's gone, you know? So this, this case really, it really pulls at me because of the fact that I, like them, I lost a loved one, you know? This case also reminds me so much of the George Owens case, which is also about another elderly person who ended up disappearing and never being seen from again. Uh, I remember that they did an update to this case where his son, I think his son went to one of the areas that they believed Rogers was at, and the son was trying to, you know, locate his father. And, and that, that kind of gets me, you know, that kind of gets me. Part of me, when I first saw this case, part of me was thinking, you know what? I hope his son would find his father, you know? And, and, and it could, you know, I was wondering if it could have been an issue with like, because they believed that Raw just had a stroke. Well, you know, at least I, I, I was thinking that they were going to find Rogers, but he would have like amnesia or something. But they, they ended up never finding him, which is sad. But yeah, so that was uh, the case, well, the final case of uh, of this uh, episode of Unsolved Mysteries. This is actually a pretty small, pretty uh, small, I guess you could say, an amount of cases. Uh, the 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 biggest case, the longest case in this video was actually the case of Robert Matthews. That's what took up the most time of this episode. But yeah, so when I return, I will be right back with my final thoughts.
Okay, it is now time for my final thoughts, and basically, this is going to be a little bit different because normally when I do Black Sight Files for Men's Mysteries, I give you my final thoughts about the case that we just watched, or that, that we just heard about. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be doing a little bit of a breakdown of Season 1, Episode 10 of Unsolved Mysteries itself. I'll give you the positives, I'll give you the negatives, and then I will give you the uh, final grade. So, let's start off with the positives. As always, you want to start with the good before you, you know, you go off into the bad, if you know what I mean. When it comes to the positives, the, uh, the show started off on a strong foot. It started with the, uh, uh, Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff case. This was a wanted case, you, as you heard earlier in this video. I think that, uh, for an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, to be really successful, one of the things it needs to do, it needs to start off on a strong foot. And they did that with this case. It actually started off on a very strong foot. It asks the question, was Charles Sigmund murdered or was he killed in, uh, was he killed in self-defense? This is ultimately something that you, the viewer, will have to determine. If you are a fan of aliens or, un or unusual phenomenon, basically, you will like the Robert Matthews case. This case for its genre was very intense. Uh, the last case I can really say that left uh, kind of like a bone chilling feel in me when it came to unusual phenomenon was the case of the Allagash abductions but it sounds like that that case could have been faked but still even though it could have been faked it still kind of leaves that uh, nervous feeling in me when I watch it the Robert Matthews case was very strong because of the fact that the show at that time was really, it had that low, but or small budget uh, feeling to it. And they really had the, they really built up the atmosphere when it came to this case. I strongly urge that you watch this case on YouTube because that's the only way you can really see it. Unless you have it on the box set like I do. Oh boy. Up next we have the Rogers Kane. Uh, case that was a very emotional case because like i said i lost a parent quite a while ago i say quite a while but it's, it's only been three years but still it feels it, it still hits home every time i think about it i i feel for roger's family because they're they they are still trying to find their loved one whereas when i lost my parent uh basically i had a little bit of closure after a little bit I'm still I'm still grieving, but I have that closure. I know what ultimately ended up happening to my mom. Roger's family, they don't know what happened to him. And to me, you know, it was the hearing about how his son went out looking for his father and everything. That really just that really hits at me, you know. But yeah, so that 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 case was very emotional, and that's why it is on the positives list. What's there left? What's left there to say, ladies and gentlemen? Season one awesomeness. If you watch season one and then you compare it to, like, say, season five or six, production wise, I'm not talking about stories, but production wise, you can see the the difference is like night and day. Whereas, like, say, I think it was like season four is when they really started to uh, pull in the money from NBC. You can really see the difference in the production value. Now, I'm not I'm not shitty on it. I loved the low budget production feel that Unsolved Mysteries had. But we I know that ultimately everything needs to change. But still, we are in season 1. We are in the heart of season 1 right now, and that's when you are getting all the most awesome cases right now. And then we have Robert Stack. Uh every every episode Robert Stack seems to be in a different location. This time around, he was like at an observatory, which is pretty apt because of the fact that we use observatories to look into space. And we ended up having a case about UFOs. So it, it made a lot of sense. I actually liked that location that they had Robert Stack at, that observatory. I think it was fucking awesome. 
when it comes to the negatives, boy, we have some negatives, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I cannot be objective if I'm just like singing the praise of unsolved mysteries and everything. You have to to do uh, to do a proper review. You got to give the the good, the positives, and the negatives. I refuse that, to think that anything is totally perfect. Nothing is. There is no such thing as a perfect movie. There's no such thing as a perfect TV show. There's no such thing as a perfect. Uh, action figure there's nothing that's perfect for every positive that something has there has to be a negative and with this episode there are some negatives there are some negatives i personally don't think that the don henry and kevin ives case needed to be included in this episode it really added nothing new to the case it didn't offer a close i, I would have been willing to understand if this if this uh case had some sort of conclusion to it then i could understand them justifying you know adding it to this episode but basically all it was was really robert stack and the detective sitting in a police room like a like a conference room or whatever and they were just kind of basically talking back and forth i like that format i do but they really didn't add anything new to it while i love the rough recording style, the low budget style, whatever you want to call it, I can honestly understand why younger people may be turned off, uh, turned off to it. I feel this is kind of the opposite for me when it comes to media today. There is a restaurant that I love to go to. They're right across the street, and they have a, a working television that has various programs on. However, I think it's operating at a, like a higher frame rate. It's digital. It, it's all, it has all the bells and whistles. However, I've watched that and I just, I, to me, it looks so fucking fake. I, it's like you can look at it and you can tell like what the green screen is and everything. That's to me. So it's like I'm the polar opposite. I can tell the different. You know, I don't like the newer stuff because it just doesn't look real. But I can also understand why somebody, you know, a, a child who was born in 2005, or 2005, let's say, and that they are 19 years old now, they may look at Unsolved Mysteries from season one and go, oh my God, that's low budget. That looks bad. I can understand that. Like where I can look at a newer show from today and go, oh my God, how can you watch this? It, it looks weird, you know. So that you know, the even though I like it, I think the 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 low budget recording style could be turned off to some people that are younger. I feel that for an an episode of Unsolved Mysteries to be really to be to be the best, I think it needs at least like five ep five cases. This case, this episode had three cases. And one filler segment, the filler segment being the uh, the Ives, the Henry slash Ives case. That filler segment literally went for just a little over three minutes, if I remember correctly. This this episode really, it was it really leaned on the Robert Matthews case, which I which I you know I'm okay with. I'm just letting you know that because of that case taking so long. This this episode was actually uh, pretty small in the in the amount of cases that there actually were. We had the wanted case, the wanted uh, case of Gary Goff and Anna Sigmund. We had the unusual phenomenon or un, the un, unexplained or whatever you want to call it of Robert Matthews. We had the lost loves slash slash missing. Uh, Oh, Rogers Kane, and then we had the filler segment of uh, Robert Stack talking to the police officer regarding Don Henry and Kevin Ox. This was a very small episode in the amount of cases that there were. Uh, I felt that the Robert Matthews case was perfect the way it was. However, I'm not sure if it was because the producers wanted to try and just add more gravitas to the Robert Matthews case, but they added another, they had uh, another story 
added to the end of the Robert Matthews case, basically regarding uh, Christina Florence. Now, I'm not I'm not shitting on Christina at all. I would have actually l- have liked to see the Christina Florence case have its own segment where they could have properly expanded upon it. But they literally added it towards the end of the Robert Matthews case, and it, it just felt like it was just tacked on. Uh, it just felt like it was tacked on. It wasn't really needed. Like I said, I don't, I don't mind it. I just wish that it had its own segment for it to really expand because they kind of really rushed through Christina uh, Florence's portion of that vi- that case, whereas they had time to really build up Robert Matthews for Christina Florence's like. She was in a car with her sister. Car had to pull over. Mother left uh, Christina and her sister in the car while she went to get water for her overheating engine. Christina, I think it was Christina, got out of the car. She looked up. She said, oh, my God. You know, it, it was just too fast. And I think they, they just crammed it, you know. As I said before, uh, whereas I feel like five cases is like the sweet spot for every episode of Unsolved Mysteries. You also need to have a nice variety of cases. Now that now everything you're he- seeing here, it's just my opinion. It's just my opinion. I am not saying that it's fact or not, but this is what I personally view as, view as positives and negatives. When it came to this episode, we even though we had different cases, we had un, the unexplained, we had uh, a, a wanted case, we had the missing person a missing person case and then we had like a little update video because of i like to have just a lot and because of that even though the cases were all different it just it it just lacked the case variety especially since we only had three cases i think for an episode to be really good we need a ghost case ghost is like an um uh, it's like a must we need ghosts we need uh, UFOs, aliens, something like that. We need possibly missing person, wanted, and murder. We we need a wide variety, but due to this episode only having three cases, they really kind of, la- you know, it didn't have that total variety there. Even though they were different, it just didn't have that wide variety. Three cases and one update, and the update portion was only like uh, three minutes. They really, really leaned on the Robert Matthews case, and thank God that case was awesome. If that case was awesome, this this episode would have been worse than what it is that I, the grade that I gave it, which you will see at the very end. Finally, I'm not shitting on Christina Florence. I don't want people to think that I am. I just wish that that case had its own segment where it could have properly been expanded. Where people could actually hear, you know, what, you know, hear, you know, everybody's, uh, their thoughts. But because of that, they ended up just kind of, you know, tacking the Christina Florence case onto the end of the Robert Matthews case. And it really just felt like it unnecessarily bloated the Robert Matthews case. When it comes to the final grade, I know this, that since this is like my first review of an entire episode of Unsolved Mysteries, this is going to upset people. And I, I kind of don't want to give it this grade, but the fact is the negatives, here, let me pull up, the negatives really outweighed all of the positives. Because of that, I am giving this grade, this uh, episode the final grade of B-. minus. Now, like I said, the cases the cases with the exception of the update they all did a fine job of doing what they needed to do granted the uh robert matthews case felt like it went on a little bit too long but then they also tacked on the christina florence case so that just made it feel even longer you were there were times i would watch the robert matthews case i'd be like okay this seemed like this would seem like a good place to end it but it just kept going. It just kept going. I'm not mad about that. I'm not. But I have to look at it, you know, compared to other episodes of Unsolved Mysteries. You know, when you could have 
five, six cases that told a pretty good story per case. And then we have episode 10 of season one, where it was just three cases with one update. And one of the cases was like this long, and then the others were like this long. It just didn't, the pacing didn't feel right to me. Yeah. But yeah, so that was the, uh, that was my grade, overall grade is B minus. I'm not saying that this is a bad episode. It's not. It's not. It just, it just, it just didn't really make it for me. I loved everything about it, but I have to be honest. It's just the negatives outweigh the positives. But well, that is it, everybody. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who has watched this video. I am going to uh, get this ready to upload. And as always, if you like what you watch, feel free to click that subscribe button. If you don't like what the positives and negatives or the grade, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Tell me why you you know you think that the grade should be higher. Or maybe if it should be lower. You, tell me what you think about the uh, positives and the negatives. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Until next time, my name is Jeff, a.k.a. Jeekers. Wishing you all a great day. Stay safe, everybody. Peace out.